Good evening, everybody. I am finally back at home and so glad to be back at home. Uh, my most recent trip was my most awesome, though I've been traveling so much lately. I'm uh, very excited to be home and stay home for a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, there we go. All right. It's been so long since we'd had class that I barely remembered how to... <laughs> How to do it? How to set everything up? Uh, but I think we're good. I think we got everything. All right, here we are. Okay, cool. Um, so hi everybody. Uh, I, uh, I'm so I'm back. It's Boethius class number four. We are ready to go. Um, so this past weekend was Mythmood. Which is why I'm still a little sleepy and uh, and a little confused. I hope I'll be sufficiently clear-headed uh, to teach here tonight. Um, for those of you who were there at MythMoot, I don't have to tell you how awesome it was. But for those of you who weren't, let me give you one little one little glimpse into exactly how much fun or the level of like absorbing fun that MythMoot was. So uh, it turns out turns out that I had a broken finger the entire time I was at Mythmoot. I broke my finger last Tuesday, spent the entire four days at the conference with a broken finger in my left hand, and I didn't even notice because I was having so much fun at Mythmoot. Um, I got in the car, was driving home from D.C. to New Hampshire, and I'm like, gosh, my finger still really hurts. I didn't really notice that. Uh, I went and got x-rays on Monday, and it's broken. Uh, so there we are. Um, so that's fun, um, but uh, yeah, so it's awesome. It's it was it was so much fun. I can't even tell you. Like it's um, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are like two of the people I was dancing with on Saturday night were like, "Oh, really? Yeah, it's fine. It's obviously it's not that bad." Uh, or I'd have been yelping in pain. Um, it was fine. No, it was. Um, uh, it's just I just jammed the finger, and turns out it's cracked, which is why it wasn't getting better. But it's fine. Just a just a little, just a little achy. Yeah, n not quite nine-fingered Timothy, though it is my ring finger that I broke. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, but it's all good. Um, <laughs> but yes, exactly. So I, uh, we had a masquerade ball, and I dressed as Boethius. Uh, so I was in this... Uh, this sort of raggedy, uh, simple tunic uh, uh, with a rope around my neck. So I was, I was, I, I, I went as Boethius to the to the to the costume ball, uh, which was fun. Um, but um, yeah, so so it was it was it was great. I mean, we had you know we had the, the masquerade ball, you know, where I, as I mentioned, I got to dance with so many people. I uh, I, I I I taught Verlin Flieger how to fox trot. It was awesome. Uh, so it was, this was. Um, this was this was great, uh, Jennifer. We did talk about Baron Luthien, the Baron Luthien book, a little bit around the campfire. Um, though, uh, if you watched my Twitter live broadcast, you will have noticed that mostly it was people egging me uh, to to uh, uh, to rant about uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's "Here with a Thousand Faces" around the campfire. That that's what they decided. Apparently, they wanted me to they wanted to try to provoke me to talking about on uh, uh, on, on the air. Uh, but it was it was really fun. It was it was great. I mean, the conference, really from top to bottom, um, was a, an, an incredible intellectual experience. The talks were so good. Mike Drought started it off with a, um, a talk which was really just one of these talks I think is going to be is going to be alluded back to and cited. Um, uh, it was really sort of talking about this the, the importance of this moment in the study of literature and the study of philology and and uh, sort of where we can go uh, as literary scholars uh, in our relationship with language. It was a it was a, it was a marvelous talk. We're going to have uh, that talk on um, uh, the Signum uh, webpage actually, sort of on the uh, on the the main page for our Germ Germanic philology concentration because that's you know. Uh, that's that's really what it was all about. So that was great. So we started with that. We ended uh, the conference with Serena Higgins giving a wonderful talk about uh, the relationship between inkling studies and modernism and, and sort of really a, a, a call to conceive not only of the inklings in a different way from how most people conceive them, but their relationship with the modernists and 20th century literature in a new way. Uh, again, I thought a really important talk. And in the middle, Verlin Flieger's talk on wonder in Tolkien, where she was looking at the, the, the way in which 
the the sort of techniques that Tolkien uses uh, to uh, to bring to to sort of bring us to a place of of wonder uh, as we are reading. Uh, it's it, really, really neat to look at the way he uses a kind of indirection uh, that way. Um, uh, anyway, it's, I mean, Ted Naismith came, and not only did Ted um, do his... Uh, Show show us his his artwork. He was looking at Baron and Luthien, and so we were looking at uh, a bunch of his Baron and Luthien artwork, both published artwork and sketches and things that he had done, and uh, and then he also uh, played us some of his music, which a lot of people don't even know that Ted Smith Ted Naismith is a musician as well, uh, but he uh, he did his uh, Baron and Luthien music as well. Uh, really really cool. We got to see the 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 the, the forged Iglos spear that David. De La Gardelle of Cedar Lore has, uh, has forged for John D. Bartolo. So cool. Anyway, so much great stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the conversations and everything. It was just the best conference I've been to. I'm really, I think, ever. Uh, not only the best, best myth mooth that we've had, but really one of the best conferences I've ever been to. So super, super exciting. Um, so I hope that, uh, that you guys will be able to to those of you who weren't there will be able to join us again we're hoping to make myth mood an annual thing um so uh, I, I sure hope you'll get a chance to uh to to come with us and join us next time um but let's get back to boethius it's been a fortnight now i had rashly planned to do boethius class last week on the one day between two trips uh when i was home which turned out to be not a great plan because i i really needed to get a bunch of other stuff done and then I was leaving at like four o'clock in the morning to drive down to DC for Mythmood the next day and I was convinced that uh, it was kind of dumb uh, just to uh, do Boethius class and then stay up late afterwards. So Jennifer, I'm glad that you consoled yourself uh, uh, philosophically for the lack of Boethius class last week. That's excellent. Um, but um, uh, good, good. Um, excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, Karita Alexander, who brought three of her siblings with her to Mythmoot, says she asked her siblings about their favorite parts of Mythmoot. Her sisters went on for a while and said a whole bunch of different things, but her brother's answer was one word, Verlin. Yeah, Verlin Flieger is just amazing. If you've never gotten a chance to meet Verlin Flieger, uh, uh, you should totally make sure to get yourself in the same place she is sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, okay, so tonight we're getting back into we're going to finish book three now i know that the second half of book three is a little bit of a slog in some ways uh it's uh this is lady philosophy getting around to some of the really kind of the central core thing you'll remember that where we got last time um you know remember book two was chiefly focused on fortune and the goods of fortune right and kind of showing how like you know the goods of fortune are and all that and everything right and how fortune uh Fortune is what she is and does what she does, right? And that's her job is to mix things up and to turn her wheel, as we see on our on our on our uh, on our, on our picture here. Um, but her 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 goods are always unstable and not really worth all that much, right? In book three, we came back to these things, and we remember the drunken man analogy, right? Where um, if uh, uh, we we pursue the goods of fortune, like a drunk man trying to get home, right? We're trying to get home. We, 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 we seek happiness. Everybody is seeking happiness. Uh, everyone is, is, is looking for the good, um, but we don't remember how to get there. Like the drunken man who knows he has a house but can't remember which road is his road, right? And all the houses kind of look alike. Um, and so that's why we pursue the goods of fortune. So the goods of fortune are not just just horrible, but they're insufficient. And we, we, we go down those roads, right? We, 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 we look at those because we're searching for the good and they kind of look like it. Um, but in the end, uh, you know, we found that that was insufficient. Um, but yes, yes, we are going to, Mariel, I haven't forgotten. Um, we're, uh, we're going to get to more, to more Latin language time. Uh, some more lingering on the Latin with Tom Hillman. Tom, of course, was at Mythmoot also, uh, which was uh, awesome to, to see him there. And here's uh, tonight, uh, Tom is going to take us through some of Lady Philosophy's 
poetry. We were looking at the, uh, the, 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 the Boethius's poetry under the influence of the muses, right? Before those muses that Lady Philosophy shows up and kicks out of the room. Here is uh, uh, one of her poems, and indeed this is uh, the first bit, the first 15 lines of the, the love poem at the end of book two that really important transitional poem, which seems at the time like a kind of a non sequitur. She's talking about fortune and talking about fortune all of a sudden. It's all the, it's the, the big love poem, right? You know, what's up with that? And we kind of talked about that a little bit. Well, here's what uh, Lady Philosophy is doing poetically here. I'm not going to read uh, the entire uh, Latin there. Um, but I'll just kind of I'll read through the English here. This is uh, uh, Tom's translation to kind of make it uh, match up with the Latin there, line for line, as much as possible. That the world with sure-footed faith carries out its changes in harmony. That the warring seeds of things an eternal treaty holds in check. That Phoebus conveys the rosy day in his golden chariot. That Phoebe rules the nights which the evening star leads forth, that the eager sea restrains its tides within a sure boundary, that rootless lands may not stretch out their borders far and wide, this series of things, love, which rules land and sea and commands heaven, binds together. Okay. Tom says, this sentence, yes, it's all one sentence, is an excellent example of what an author can do with an inflected language. The subject of the sentence is amor, the 53rd and final word in the sentence. So you finally get the subject of this the subject of the of the sentence is the very last word. Word number 53 of the sentence is the subject, right? Uh, you couldn't do that in English. It just doesn't work quite well that way, right? Uh, subject verb is the word order in English. Uh, generally, I mean, you can invert it, uh, but when you do, usually you're asking a question. Um, so uh, anyway, it's, it's it's just you can't mess with word order like this in English, but you can do that kind of thing. You can put the subject of, you know, the, the your, your nominative noun at the end of the sentence. The main verb is ligat, two lines above it and eight words before it. But I couldn't withhold this, su- but I couldn't withhold the subject that long. Those last three lines so when when he did see notice when Tom translated it into English he had to put love the subject three lines from the end he kind of flipped it and put the verb at the very end right cuz in English you have to do that right you can't you can't do it the same way they do in Latin those last three lines are compact and powerful in both languages but more so in Latin where all that goes before culminates in love which governs everything. So you'll notice that uh, one of the things that that Tom points out here first, right, is that by putting, by taking advantage of the opportunity that Latin as an inflected language gives uh, Boethius uh, to manipulate his grammar, or rather to manipulate his word order, uh, he can put the subject at the end of the sentence, which in this case is particularly appropriate. Like, love is what all of this stuff leads to and what culminates all of this stuff, right? Love is the, um, uh, uh, see, where all that go before, all that goes before culminates in love, as, uh, as, as Tom says, and, uh, asking if it reminds anybody of Dante, right? Where we have the same, the same love idea, that same love culmination, uh, certainly in Paradiso. Um, yes, uh, exactly. Marielle says, it's one reason why Latin is so fantastic. The masters can really play with the arrangement to give a real punch to their lines. Absolutely. Um, Kevin says, would that actually work in Latin? Like, could people keep all that in their head without a subject? I just find that so hard. Like, my brain couldn't do that. I can barely translate it. Kevin, no, you're right. Um, but, but, but Kevin, wait, there's more. Uh, in Latin manuscripts, they don't even put spaces between the words right? Not only is there no punctuation in a Latin manuscript, there are no line breaks, there are no spaces between the word, continuous lines of letters, and you have to figure out which words are which. This is why, one of the reasons, why it was almost completely unheard of for people, you can't just look at something and sight read it. You've got to work it out. Um, and uh, uh, it was one of the things like Julius Caesar was famous for being able to look at something and just read it, 
right away. And a lot of modern people, you know, will will read about that and they're like, oh, wow, I'm super impressed, Caesar, right? That you can just look at something and, you know, read it, right? Yeah, it's really, <laughs> you try it, right? It's really impressive. Um, and yes, the, uh, uh, Tomas, exactly. So when you were reading a, even a, a simple piece of prose, um, you'd have to you'd have to sound it out, right? You, you you'd read it through aloud, and by hearing it, you'd be able to you know figure out where the word breaks were and stuff like that. Um, so uh, exactly, Mariel, that's exactly why Saint Augustine was so amazed when that that Saint Ambrose could read silently. You just you didn't do it. I mean, nobody read silently. Almost nobody read. Saint Ambrose did apparently. Um, but um, but yeah. So I mean, it's it's uh, it's a really it's a really big deal, right? So, so Kevin, uh, this is nothing compared to what it would have been to read this in the original manuscript. Um, but yeah, th that's exactly so. Th this kind of uh, this th that kind of, of of technique, of being able to hold and suspend and figure out, you know, to kind of parse it all together. It's a non-trivial skill. It's very it's very challenging. It's very difficult. Um, but wait, but wait, there's more. Where are we? Here we are. Okay. Tom says, and that's actually the easy part. The direct object of the verb is hunk rerum seriam, this series of things, which in Latin is in the same line as the verb. Hashtag small favors. So at its most basic, this sentence says, love binds all things together. What about the rest of the sentence? Note that the first three couplets begin with quod, the fourth and fifth begin with ut, and the sixth begins with ne. Quod and ut here mean that, and ne means that not. So it's 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 another that introducer. It's just a with a negative verb. Each of these couplets is a substantive clause that functions as a noun. Each is an apposition to the direct object, hunk rerum serium, this series of things. They expand upon what the direct object summarizes. In a sense, the whole first twelve and a half lines are the direct object. Wow, huh? It says, Corey, I hope it's too late for people to drop Latin. Um, so if you look back, you can see the shape here uh, uh, pretty clearly in the uh, the words that uh, Tom has highlighted for us here. Um, so you see how the, you know each of these couplets lay, lays out one of these things. And remember, we don't yet know the subject and verb. It's almost like a, it's almost like a punchline or something, right? All we're getting is this series of things this series of substantive clauses, that the world with sure-footed face carries out its charges in harmony, quod the warring seeds of things, uh, an, eterni an eternal treaty holds in check, quod Phoebus conveys the rosy day in his golden chariot, ut Phoebe rules the nights which leads, you know, so we've got all these facts, right, all these statements. So what? What binds them all together? We don't know what connects any of these ideas, right? What is it? And then we finally get the summation of the direct objects, right? This series of things, all of that stuff you've been reading about in these other clauses, right? Um, all this series of things binds together. So, okay, the, these things, uh, again, to try to put it into English, we got to shift it around, right? These things are bound together by what, right? What's the doer of the object? What's the, uh, which, uh, so this series of things binds together which rules lands and sea and commands heaven love literally right if you if you look at the order there hunk rerum serium ligat terras ac pelagos regens et kylo imperitans amor right this series of thing binds together which rules land and sea and commands heaven love right so even there like this series of things binds together love still delays it, right? But then we get that further delay, right? Uh, that further descriptor, and we still don't know what it is. Um, it's almost like it kind of reminds me of a really long, you know, introduction, right? Like, uh, you know, like when the circus ringleader is standing there waiting to, like, sh direct the spotlight onto whoever's coming out, you know, and no! Uh, you know, a death defying and, you know, he'll go in and tell you all the things about it, but he won't tell you what it is until the end and then announces it at the end. It's almost, it works almost like that, right? Um, this series of things binds together, right? So, uh, you know, we're, we're told all these things are bound together by 
and it rules the land and sea and commands the heavens love at the end um it's really really neat the kind of effect that this has right um and retroactively it connects all those things together this is of course um really interesting again when we look back at it from the point of view of book three right as you think of where lady philosophy is going in book three lady philosophy is uh focused on as we're going to be seeing over the course of the night tonight um everything leads towards happiness everything leads towards god right everything is going in, in what direction Toward, like, love is the culmination of all of these things. Um, that's where we're going to get in book three. Um, and she's already anticipating that not only in the content of that poem at the end of book two, uh, but in the, in the syntactic stru uh, structure of that first sentence uh, of the poem at the end of book two. And uh, that's pretty slick, you have to admit. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Jennifer says, did they have drum rolls b uh, um, uh, uh, back then? It's almost like a series of drum beats with repeated words. Yes, exactly. It's that's the, uh, you know, Jennifer. I think that's what made me think of it. Um, it does sound like uh, like a drum roll. Um, and uh, 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 Tom, we have at least one offer uh, uh, that people would pay for this kind of a side by side. Uh, translation of the Latin, this kind of a sort of literal, you know, to, in, to enable people to sort of see what's going on in the, uh, in the in the Latin and stuff, you know, just a little offer there <laughs> from a couple of our listeners. Um, anyway, one last point which I really loved. Um, uh, he says, one last thing, notice how stabili fide, with sure-footed faith in the first line, responds to male fide and stabili non erat gradu in the first poem of book one. So you're, again, remember that first poem that we talked about, uh, the one that was in uh, in the first of our lingering on the Latin sections in, uh, in, in class number two. Um, the uh, male fide is about the description of fortune, right? How fortune was badly faithful. And then the stabili uh, non erit that's, uh, you know, don't call, don't consider anyone, you know, stable or secure, right? Uh, and uh, and we see that that those that, that phrase is kind of brought back together. Those words are, are brought back together. Um, but those two concepts are picked out, right? The male, uh, male fide, fide, right? Badly faithful. And, uh, and the stabili, right? The thing that you're not supposed to consider anybody. Don't consider anybody stable, right? Um, and we have uh, the beginning of this poem starts with that, right? Quod mundus stabili fide, that the world with sure-footed faith. So if, uh, if fortune is badly faithful, right, the world carries out its changes in harmony with sure-footed faith, with stabili fide, fide, right? And that's pretty cool, right? The way that this poem of Lady Philosophies is in that sense begins uh, or sort of points back to that earlier poem, uh, showing that it's almost a kind of rebuttal, right, to what the uh, to what not exactly the muses said, but what the um, what the um, what Boethius, in his emotional outburst under the influence of the muses, uh, said, right? Um, okay, cool. So. That's fun. I know you guys are also having fun with the Latin. So thanks again to Tom Hillman, uh, our resident classicist, uh, for his, uh, his uh, excellent uh, Latin snippets, as always. All right. Let's, uh, um, let's go back into the text. This is a passage that we did at the end of last class, uh, or a part of one of those passages. This is one of those moments that I just kind of wanted to pause and go back at this. We, I didn't talk about this at the end of last class, um, but, uh, but it's worth glancing at here for a second. Similarly, the man who seeks only power wastes his money, scorns pleasures and honors that carry with them no power, and thinks nothing of fame. But see how much he is missing. Sometimes he is without the necessities of life. He is plagued by anxieties, and when he cannot overcome them, he loses that which he wants most. He ceases to be powerful. Honors, fame, and pleasure can be shown to be equally defective, for each is connected with the others, and whoever seeks one without the others cannot even get the one he wants. Right? Okay. So remember, this is how the one of the th one of the things that shows that the um, the goods of fortune don't provide are not 
the real roads to happiness is that you can't you can't get happiness from them right you can't um uh they are inadequate and you see like you, if, if if you go for one of them you end up having to sacrifice a whole bunch of the others to get there and in doing so you lose even that one right um this sounded all familiar again this is another place one of those places i think where we can see as i've said before boethius is not quoting the bible right he's not relying on uh on the authority of the biblical text in order to provide consolation but as he goes through his consolation we begin to see these ideas kind of pop up that that sound kind of familiar um I called this an unlabeled gloss. Uh, this passage would be a really interesting gloss on the famous uh, uh, verse from the Gospels. Uh, he, who, uh, uh, he who loses his life will find it, but he who, uh, 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 he who seeks his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it, Jesus says. Right? If you, if you, find, if you seek your life, you'll lose it. Right? Um, how do you know the kind of this paradox? It's a it's one of those sayings of Jesus that's is, you know this kind of paradoxical saying requires explanation, right? And here, Boethius has given a gloss on it, right? This could stand as a gloss to that verse. It's not explicit, right? Um, they, he doesn't label it, doesn't allude to the Bible directly at all, but uh, but it would work, right? It definitely works that way. Um, if you seek. If you try to find happiness, and you do that by seeking worldly happiness, if you try to seek your worldly benefit, right, you're not going to get it, right? He who seeks his life will lose it. But if you give it up, right, if you if you turn away from those worldly things, right, if you don't seek power and fame and uh, and uh, pleasure and and wealth and all those other things, right, you'll gain your life, right? You'll gain happiness. You'll gain that which you truly seek. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, cool. All right. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of draw attention to that uh, as we as we went through. Um, at the very end of last of class last time, Lady Philosophy was saying, "Okay, having having looked at worldly goods, right? Having looked at um, um, the goods of fortune, uh, we found that they they." They, they're not the real way home, right? They're not the answer to our problems, right? Uh, so what is? And that's when she turned and said, well, it's, per, it's, 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 remember she ended at, well, where we ended last time. She didn't really end. We stopped in the middle of book three. Um, but where we ended last time was right after she had said, all of these things are connected together. All the, if you look at what is the essential thing that you're trying to get, right, in, uh, in the good of fortune, when you're seeking wealth, what are you really seeking? It's not really about the stuff. Remember that that issue was rejected way back in book two, right? It's not about like seeking wealth. You don't seek wealth. I mean, probably you don't seek wealth just because you really like shiny rocks, right? It's not actually about the shiny rocks or the shiny metal, right? It's about security, right? You seek wealth be, or because you want to be secure. You want to be stable so that nobody can do anything to you and that you can have what you want, right? Since why you seek power, right? You seek power because you want to be able to fulfill the desires of you, to fulfill your desires, right? To fulfill your will, that whatever you want, you can have. Uh, that's, that's a good thing, right? That would be a good to be able to have that. Um, again, as Lady Philosophy has argued, the None of the, the you know the goods of fortune which would which seem to promise this don't actually give it, but the principle behind what you're looking for in those things is a good thing. And furthermore, at the very end of the material we covered last time, um, she suggests these things are all connected together, right? The, the 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 principles of respect and honor and joy and uh, and security. And uh, you know, and 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 power, the ability to the ability to achieve your desires. These things are all connected. You can't have one without the other. They're all they're all unified. And that again, one of the problems is we keep the reason we fail to find happiness is we keep trying to break them up. Right? We keep trying to go after only one of them or only a piece of them when they're all unified and brought together. And that's where she ended with, and that one place where all of those things are together and unified isn't here on earth. Right. 
um, it's in heaven and we, she paused to say, okay, let's do an invocation. And that's where we're picking up here tonight. Poem nine of book three, uh, where Lady Philosophy turns and invokes God. And here is her invoke. We're going to look at the beginning and the end of her invocation here. O God, maker of heaven and earth, who govern the world with eternal reason, at your command time passes from the beginning. You place all things in motion, though you are yourself without change. No external causes impelled you to make this work from chaotic matter. Rather, it was the form of the highest good, existing within you without envy, which caused you to fashion all things according to the eternal exemplar. You, who are the most beautiful, produce the beautiful world from your divine mind, and forming it in your image, you order the perfect parts in a perfect whole. You bind the elements in harmony so that cold and heat, dry and wet are joined, and the purer fire does not fly up through the air, nor the earth sink beneath the weight of water. Okay, um, that last line, of course, is uh, begins to show application, right? Um, how does... Uh, uh, God govern the world with eternal reason. How, you know, where do we see that manifested? The binding of the elements in harmony is one of the places um, where uh, where we see those uh, uh, those those things joined together. And those are the fundamental elements. By the way, um, you may think that air, earth, fire, and water are the fundamental elements, and they kind of they are, um, but they're but that's not what the elements are made of, right? The elements consist of something, right? They're made up of something. And what they're made up of are the four basic principles, which are cold and heat, dry and wet, right? Um, and by combining those four things in the four different possible combinations, you come up with earth, air, fire, and water, right? Like air is hot and dry, right? Whereas uh, 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 water is cold and wet. You know, you can see how it works. No, wait. Well, shoot, water is hot and wet, and earth is is uh, is 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 cold and wet. Anyway, you combine these four things together. Um, they're combined together through the reason of God. These these are these are contraries that are bound together, uh, so that they the whole world doesn't fly apart, but instead everything uh, works comfortably all together. Um, anyway, okay. Uh, and oh, but I forget, who was it who said this at the beginning of class? Was it Jennifer? Yes, uh, Jennifer Pope saying she's been reading C.S. Lewis's the, the Discarded Image, which is an amazing companion to this class. It sure is, Jennifer. Um, Boethius uh, says a lot of the things that, um, uh, that C.S. Lewis based the Discarded Image on, uh, and Lewis does a wonderful job of bringing everything together uh, into sort of showing the larger medieval worldview, which is fun. And yes, Carita, this is where the humors system comes from, too. Um, the elements are composed of the of uh, cold and heat and dry and wet, and so are the the four constituent uh, humors within the human body, because the, the, the human body is like a little microcosm of the world. It's all fun. Um, anyway, okay, okay. But let's go back to that first paragraph. O God, maker of heaven and earth, who govern the world with eternal reason, at your command, time passes from the beginning. You place all things in motion, through you, though you yourself are without change. No external causes impelled you to make this work from chaotic matter. Rather, it was the form of the highest good, existing within you without envy, which caused you to fashion all things according to the eternal exemplar. You, who are most beautiful, produce the beautiful world from your divine mind. And forming it in your image, you order the perfect the perfect parts in a perfect whole. Okay, so this shows the sort of theological principle that underlies most of the rest of the argument here in Book Three, right? This and and this is another one of those things which another one of the parts of Boethius's argument which a lot of modern people want to argue with. Boethius isn't interested in arguing about this because it's one of his givens that he gets from 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 classic Platonic uh, 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 theory, right? And that is. Uh, things always proceed from perfect to imperfect, right? If something exists that is imperfect, it shows that there was something more perfect from which it came. Everything declines, right? That's a given. We know this is this is known, right? Um, and Boethius is not trying to prove it because 
the those works that he takes as the givens as the starting point uh, of his argument accept that right um, so don't expect him it's unfair to ask him it's, he, this is he 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 states this as as, as his given right uh, given that everything that is perfect comes from something or everything that is imperfect comes from something that is more perfect um, so this is the pattern notice how she is invoking God this is not just a random prayer by the way right. Um, she's not just being like, and now uh, let us pause to pray together, and then we'll move on, right? So this is a brief, uh, though devout, kind of uh, 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 um, diversion, right, or uh, um, distraction from the argument. It's not at all. Uh, in fact, if anything, this poem kind of gives away the entire rest of the book. Um, you could almost but not quite read this poem and stop reading as she's going to say most of everything that she's going to get to ultimately um, by the end of book three um, through this invocation. So so again, what is she emphasizing? What's she pointing to? God is the perfect, right? He is the most beautiful that produces the beautiful world from his divine mind, right? He fashions things uh, according to the eternal exemplar, which is himself, right? Um, the world reflects the beauty and orderliness of the divine mind. The human soul is also going to, as she's going to explain in a minute, the human soul is also a reflection of the divine mind as well. Um, okay, let's... Uh, Let's keep going. So, but Tony, this is as ecumenical as the rest of the book. It is, because it, this is this, this is not Boethius lapsing like. Uh, pardon me for like a brief uh, uh, Christian interlude, right? That's not what's happening here. Um, it is with his pagan predecessors that he's agreeing here, and it is based upon a Platonic theology that this is built, right? So this is Plato's theology. This is not biblical theology. This is not Christian theology. I mean. It like pretty much agrees with Christian theology, and it, it might sound. I mean, like you know, forming it in your image, like does that sound like Genesis one? Yeah, it does. But it's Plato, right? I mean, this is why this is why the medievals read Plato, and they were like Socrates, right? Socrates being, of course, the protagonist of most of the Platonic dialogues. They're like Socrates was totally saved, wasn't he? He had to be. Right? I mean, come on. So they actually came up with theories that, like, Plato must have, like, must have somehow gotten the books of Moses or something. They're like, like, Moses probably lived before Plato. So, you know, like, Plato totally might have seen the books of Moses and somehow gotten access to Revelation because, dang, right? Like, dude had it figured out. <laughs> right? And so the, the closeness between a lot of Platonic theology and Christian theology. Uh, was um, was not lost on the medieval. So this is again. So this is not Boethius breaking his frame, and like lapsing all Christian in the middle of his thing. This is Plato. This is Plato. It's all in Plato. It's all in Plato. <laughs> so that's exactly uh, that's exactly what's uh, uh, what's uh, what's going on there. Um, but uh, anyway, okay, cool. Um, yeah, did they, he receive honorary Christian status? Almost, Karita. I mean, almost. Uh, something something kind of like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, Rachel, form of the highest good is a philosophical term. Um, uh, see, rather, it was the form of the highest good existing within you which caused you to fashion all things. Yes. Um, so th what what is the, 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 the thing that led to, the thing that enabled the... Uh, the origin point, right, of all creation was the form of the highest good that is within God, right? So to say that is as much as to say God formed it in his image. It's just different language uh, to sort of talk about basically the same thing. Um, yeah, exactly. Both Jennifer and Sharon are both uh, uh, talking about Plato in, in Dante. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, um, they're, in a, um, they're in limbo. The, the first circle of hell where like the uh the the people who are like not actually saved but also not really damned either uh live yeah yeah um yeah good um all right 
Let's keep going. This is the end of the poem. In like manner, you create souls in lesser living forms, and adapting them to their high flight in swift chariots, you scatter them through the earth and sky. And when they have turned again toward you, by your gracious law, you call them back like leaping flames. Grant, O Father, that my mind may rise to thy sacred throne. Let it see the fountain of good. Let it find light, so that the clear light of my soul may fix itself in thee. Burn off the fogs and clouds of earth, and shine through in thy splendor. For thou art the serenity, the tranquil peace of virtuous men. The sight of thee is beginning and end, one guide, leader, path, and goal. Okay, um... As I was suggesting before, this is uh, there's uh, there's a lot of spoilers uh, in here. Um, that is to say, pretty clear indicators of where she's going in the rest of her argument here. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but this is how the poems generally work in Boethius. Lady Philosophy will, um, and I personally, I think it has to do with what she keeps saying about gentle remedies and stuff, right? Uh, poetry is soft and appealing, right? It, it's, uh, it's not like I'm going to walk you through the rigorous steps of logic. I'm just going to sing pleasantly about stuff. But the stuff that she sings pleasantly about in one poem is very off. Sometimes the poem merely reflects back on the stuff that she's been talking about. As, for instance, those sections where she went through the goods of fortune, right, wealth and power and uh, uh, honors and fame and all that stuff. And then she, you know, so she, she did the prose argument and then had a poem reflecting on it, right? Uh, so sometimes that's the pattern, but just as often she will say in a poem something that she's not going to get even get around to in her in her argument for like several prose sections to come. Um, we often get kind of like previews or spoilers uh, in the poems, and I think that's one of the things that we see here. What does she describe in her invocation? Again, she's praying, praying to God, invoking God, and describing what he does. Um, he creates souls in like manner. Right, just like he creates the world, he creates souls. Right, uh, things which are derived from his perfect, from from the form uh, of the good that is in him, uh, and uh, you scatter them through the earth and sky. And when they have turned again toward you, by your gracious law, you call them back like leaping flames. How do leaping flames come back? Right, when you have fire which is being released. Right? When something's burning, that is, what does it do? Fire jumps up. Why does the fire jump up? Well, we learned about this last time, right? Don't make me don't make me punish another paper clip to, to show you that. Right? The, the 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 mineral things, right? The mineral things want to drop down because their home is is the earth, right? Down below. Fire lives up above. It, li- it lives above the air. That's why fire always goes up, because it's uh, it's trying to go upwards, right? Um so cool um uh notice what she's suggesting here in the poem the souls of people are like those flames right where did the souls of people come from they came from god right people are made in the image of god the souls of uh, the rational souls of rational creatures are in the image in the image of the god of reason uh and so what do they want just like the paperclip wants to go down and the fire wants to go up human souls want to return to god it's their natural inclination right and god calls them back like leaping flames grant O father that my mind may rise to thy sacred throne in her prayer in her invocation she is asking that this happen right no but notice by the way there is uh, an intervention again coming back to uh, uh again i i love that phrase uh k that you used uh back in week one right god you missed a spot right why is it that it's only human beings you know in human actions where injustice seems to reign in the rest of an otherwise orderly world right um and uh th- this seems to be acknowledged and, and when they have turned again toward you right which seems to suggest they don't automatically turn towards you. They have to choose to do this. The, the human will is involved there, that the human will can resist uh, turning towards God. It would seem to be implied there in the poem, though we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit more time on this <coughs> uh, later on. Um, but through the invocation, Lady Philosophy is leading Boethius to reverse that, 
right, in his will to ask, to, to pray that God would bring his mind back into union with him. Let it see the fountain of good. Let it find light so that the clear light of my soul may fix itself in thee. Uh, we want the, we want light, not the, not the clouds and, and, uh, and fogs of earth, right? Remember the, 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 the mists of mortality that was wiped out of Boethius's eyes with his tears, right? By Lady Philosophy back in book one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, David asks, David Attlee asks, uh, did the uh, medievals think of celestial spheres as being attached to individual souls? Is that what philosophy is referring to? Uh, that is, uh, souls in lesser living forms and adapting them to their high flight and swift chariots scattered through the earth and sky. Yeah, yeah, it's not just humans. Um, uh, it's all, it, the, all spiritual beings, angelic beings, basically, um, which are in the earth, both earth and sky, and in the heavens, right, in the, in the spheres themselves. Um, those are rational beings, too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, does the passage there, uh, oh, oh, the, uh, um, the movement up and out of the cave towards the light, should we be thinking of, uh, the allegory of the cave from Plato's Republic? Uh, Seems reasonable to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we kind of should be thinking about that. Um, Brian, I'm not sure. Brian is asking what the image of the high flight and swift chariots is kind of getting at, adapting them to their high flight in swift chariots. Um, I'm not sure, Brian. I'm not sure I understand that uh, metaphor. Is it talks about God creating the souls and the lesser living forms, right? And scattering them through the earth and sky. But in the midst of that, we get adapting them to their high flight and swift chariots. That's part of the, like the, that's like the, I don't know what, the prerequisite to the scattering through the earth and sky is what the syntax, at least in the English translation, would seem to suggest. Um, is that what's going on? Is, you know, so, if so... What are the what is the high flight and swift chariots of the souls in lesser living forms? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't think that that means she's she's only referring to sort of angelic beings or planetary intelligences here. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I I don't so I don't think that that's sort of uh, relevant there. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Karita, we're going to get to that. Karita's asking about, like, what about, you know, humans that appear less rational? or what? The, 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 the extent to which the reason the rational soul of people uh, it gets distanced from God and from pure reason, that's, uh, we'll come back to that uh, later on. Um, Hmm. Joyce Sturgeo asks, is, uh, is it a reference to Phaeton? Uh, are all souls, in a sense, Phaeton or Phaeton? Uh, Phaeton, of course, being the mortal son of Apollo, who asks to drive the chariot of the sun, and Apollo's like, you really don't want to do that, that's not a good idea, and Phaeton's like, I don't care, you promised, and Apollo's like, well, dang it, okay, and he lets him drive it, and of course he wrecks it, because he's immortal and can't steer the horses, uh, and so the sun almost collides into the earth, and everything is almost destroyed, and uh, Phaeton is killed, and falls, uh, 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 is, you know, the, basically Zeus has to shoot the chariot down. Um... I mean, Joyce, it would be that would work in a sense, but I, I, it, I don't think so. The reason I don't think that uh, Lady Philosophy is making a Phaeton reference here is that, and yes, for Jane Austen fans, that's where the name of that chariot in Jane Austen, a, 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 a to, to have a Phaeton with ponies, is uh, is a reference to that myth, which is kind of fun. Um, but anyway, um, so. Uh, uh, I don't think it's a reference to Phaeton, mostly because this isn't about fall. This is about return, right? This is an invocation. This is about the turning back towards God. First, 
uh, recognizing that he is the source of all these things, and then talking about heading back to him, right? Not about fall. Uh, I guess it's not saying there's no fall involved at any stage of the process, but that's not what the poem seems to really be interested in and really primarily about. Um, it's about fixing uh, uh, your soul, fixing itself, where, where your soul came from in the first place, and then fixing it back into that place uh, afterwards. Um, so that's why I doubt that she's making a Phaeton reference. Um, yeah, okay, let's carry on. Then consider whether the same conclusion is not even more firmly established by this, that there cannot exist two highest goods which differ from one another. Clearly, when two goods differ, one cannot be the other. Therefore, neither can be perfect, since it lacks the other. But that which is not perfect certainly cannot be the highest good. Therefore, those things which are the highest good cannot be diverse. But I have proved that happiness in God are the highest good. Therefore, that must be the highest happiness, which is the highest divinity. I can think of nothing truer or more reasonable or worthier of God, I said. First, this is kind of an example of how the end of book three goes, right? We get a lot of this stuff, right? A lot of this uh, 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 kind of slogging through uh, fil- uh, steps in the logical argument. And when I um, kind of... Um, you know, kind of zoom in on this a little bit, right? It kind of makes, I mean, I, it's, you can make sense of it, right? You can see the purpose of talking like this. Um, because, you know, it's not just, Lady Philosophy is not taking stuff for granted, right? She's not just asserting things. She's showing, like, this stuff all fits logically. At the same time, I can't help being not a person of very, uh, 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 a very rigorous mind. I can't help sort of backing up and saying, okay, I, I, I totally get it. I'm willing to grant your premise. And can we, can we move on? No, no. Oh, we're still talking about this. Okay. We're still, all right. I get, I see. Yes. I see. Okay, good. All right, good. Fine. Let's go. Um, what I would say about this, you can tell the bits that Lady Philosophy is trying to focus, like the bits where Lady Philosophy is in a sense expecting resistance, right? Um, I would take this as a kind of an indicator of the places where, these are the places where Boethius is conscious of kind of doing something a little bit different, or, or taking the, uh, these, you know, the, the philosophy and the theology of the ancients, right? Like, a, you know, the, the, the Aristotelian and, and, uh, and Platonic stuff and doing something kind of new with it, right? Those places where he just kind of makes these statements and leaves them, that's where he's just quoting, right? That's where he's just alluding to the stuff that they said before. When he does this kind of thing, like, okay, let's really meticulously look at each step in the argument. So we're not just going to say, what does this all boil down to, right? God is happiness. I kind of gave it away (laughs) there in my subtitle, right? Um, Happiness and God are the highest good. Therefore, they're the same thing right? Um, the highest good and God are identified with each other. Therefore, that must be the highest happiness, which is the highest divinity, right? Okay, so God is happiness. That's it, right? But we have to, we have to get there very cautiously. Um, uh, so, okay, all right, you know, we need to be, um, we need to be patient with these things, right? Um, Remember she said before, like, we don't find happiness in the earth, right? We find these things that look like happiness. And remember, she was saying the problem that we have ultimately, at the end of the day, the problem that we have with worldly goods, the reason worldly goods don't get us anywhere, is that they're trying to break the unified, the one unified good into pieces, right? She showed all of these things are connected together. You can't have, you know, joy without security, because if you don't have the security, right, your joy is going to be insecure. You can't, uh, you know, you can't have uh, uh, respect without power and all, you know, all these things together, all the, the core principles involved in the, the, those are all unified. They are one thing. And she defines that one thing as happiness, true happiness, right? True happiness is the attainment of all of these things together. And God is the highest good. God is true happiness. It is identified. So notice, um, logically, what she is insisting on here is not that God is happy, right? She's not saying nobody is happier than God is happy. 
That's not what she's saying. She's saying that the ultimate happiness, that thing that we all strive for. Remember, that was, a, that was a, one of the givens before everybody seeks happiness. There's nobody that doesn't seek happiness, right? Not everybody gets it, right? Uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and not everybody agrees on how to get it, but everybody is, everybody is, uh, is, is seeking to better themselves, to improve them. Everyone is seeking to satisfy their desires, right? What is the satisfaction of desires? What is the highest good? What is that thing that we're all seeking? God himself is the answer, right? It's not that something that God has. It's not that she's just saying it is a thing that is, you know, uniquely in the gift of God. Only God can give it, right? That's not what she's saying. Um, it is. Yes, Rachel, exactly. God is the definition of happiness. Um, God's being himself, that ultimate unification of all things, right? That perfection of all things held simultaneously, which God must have logically in order to be God, as she says at various other points, that is the happiness that we're seeking. Which is, in some ways, a little bit counterintuitive, actually. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what that looks like. From this conclusion, then, I will give you a kind of corollary, just as the geometricians infer from their demonstrated propositions, things which they call deductions. Since men become happy by acquiring happiness, and since happiness is divinity itself, it follows that men become happy by acquiring divinity. So notice, this is, this is where... Uh, one thing that I've seen a bunch of times before, right? You sort of... Uh, 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 like the Christian thing, right? A lot of Christians will follow Boethius's argument up to this point, and you know the, through the invocation, right, which makes them which makes them happy, right? And then they're like, okay, so you see, all of this happiness is in God, uh, and they're like, yes, okay, ultimate happiness is in God, right? This is just what I. And then she goes, and so logically, in order to be truly happy, you seek to be God, and the Christians are like, ooh. Hmm, hang on. <laughs> right? That's not necessarily the place where they thought we were headed uh, with this. Um, but logically, right, if you, 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 you become happy by acquiring happiness, and we've already defined it, right, ultimate happiness is God. And so therefore, you become ultimately happy, you achieve happiness by acquiring divinity. So that ultimate goal that ultimate goal to, that uh, that that everybody has, right? That natural inclination that everybody has to seek happiness, to satisfy desires, leads you not just to God, right? Like, oh, hi, God, right? That's not it, right? It leads you to become God, to acquire divinity, because that's what it means to become happy. For as men become just by acquiring integrity and wise by acquiring wisdom, so they must in a similar, similar way become gods by acquiring divinity. Thus, everyone who is happy is a god. And, although it is true that God is one by nature, still there may be many gods by participation. What does that mean? Well, again, spoilers, right? Grant, O Father, that, the, that my mind may rise to thy sacred throne. Let it see the fountain of good. Let it find light, so that the clear light of my soul may fix itself in thee. Burn off the fogs and clouds of earth, and shine through in thy splendor. For thou art the serenity, the tranquil peace of virtuous men. The sight of thee is beginning and end. One guide, leader, path, and goal. Right? That returning to God. The souls came from God, the souls desire to return from God, just as the minerals of that are taken from the earth desire to return and rejoin the earth and become earth, right? Just as the fire which is in the, uh, uh, you know, which is being released on the earth seeks to go up and rejoin the sphere of fire, where it will be fire, right? Just so souls which come from God and are made by God and sent down into the world, right, uh, scattered through the earth and sky, desire to return back to God and to be joined with God, to be God. And that is uh, the, this uh, ultimate happiness. This is the natural inclination of people. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Oh, James. Uh, good question. James Stevens says, does fix itself uh, mean... To, uh, sorry, back in the poem, right? Uh, yes. My soul may fix itself in thee. Does it mean to repair itself or to place itself? To place itself. To I, I, I believe that means affix, right? To, to fasten itself. Um, I, I believe that that's what he means there. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing, Kevin, at your theological question. Not that your theological question is funny, uh, but I'm laughing, Kevin, because I saw that you were here and I was waiting for you to ask questions <laughs> like this. I knew you would. Kevin was at Mythboot, and uh, I, I've uh, been with Kevin at a bunch of conferences, and I know how much he loves to talk about theological questions of this kind. Um, I'm going to dodge Kevin's question. First, I'll share Kevin's question. Then I'm going to duck it. Okay? So, Kevin, I'm going to warn you. I'm not going to answer your question. Uh, Kevin's question is, uh, he says, you know, I thought, you know, cre uh, creation in the Christian system is ex nihilo, including our souls, not ex deo, not from God. Uh, so does this work with Christianity? Um, I'm going to duck it. Um, my answer, Kevin, would be yes. Um, but the reason I, I, d I don't want to answer it, I don't want to get too distracted. The question of, um, are there places in the Constellation of Philosophy where Boethius is deviating from, you know, a contemporary Orthodox Christianity is an interesting question, but it's not the question I want to really focus on, right? I want to focus on what is Boethius saying? Right? What is Boethius's argument? And the extent to which that argument agrees or disagrees with other positions, I am interested as I brought it up from the beginning because it's, it's one of the big kind of framework questions that people ask about Boethius, like, is this dude Christian or what? The answer, yeah, by everything we have, this dude seems to be Christian. Do I think that this argument is generally compatible with Christianity? Yes. Um, might might one be able to accuse him of heterodoxy on certain points? That's possible, but again, that's that's that goes a little finer than I would like to uh, to, to 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 debate. Um, yeah, uh, exactly. Yes, exactly, Jennifer. We have to see uh, how my uh, how my uh, how my dexterity is, which because my dexterity would give me bonuses uh, to my dodge skills to evade. Uh, uh, to evade Kevin's questions. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, anyway, okay, sorry. I'm going back, seeking divinity, gods by participation. Okay, uh, many gods by participation. So clearly, Lady Philosophy does have this... Uh, Lady Philosophy comes back at, at the end here to say, not undermining monotheism, right? I'm not saying that we have many, many gods, right? But that many gods... There are many, can be many gods by participation with the god who is one god by nature. Um, and that's as far as she goes to explaining that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tony says uh, he's reminded of Tolkien describing death as the gift of men and how the souls of men escape the earth. Yes, beyond the circles of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. Where do they go, right? Where do they return? Where do they come from, right? Um, yeah, no, I, I exactly. Um, I think, uh, I think that that's very relevant, Tony. And let's keep going. Clearly, all the rest must be related to the good. For riches are sought because they are thought good. Power, because it is believed to be good. And the same is true of honor, fame, and pleasure. Therefore, the good is the cause and sum of all that is sought for. For if a thing has in it neither the substance nor the appearance of good, it's not sought or desired by men. On the other hand, things which are not truly good but only seem to be are sought after, as if they were good. It follows, then, that goodness is rightly considered the sum, pivot, and cause of all that men desire. Goodness is considered the sum of all that men desire, it's the pivot of all men desire, and it's the cause of all that men desire. Right? Um, I don't focus on the first and the last. I'm not 100% sure I understand the pivot metaphor. Maybe one of you can explain that to me. But sum and cause, certainly, I can understand, 
right? Um, goodness is the sum of everything that men desire. So that ultimate goodness, which is the unification of all of those things, again, security, joy, power, respect, all that stuff. Um, the goodness, which is the unity of all those things, is the sum of everything that men desire. Uh, yep, okay, I can see that. It's also the cause of all that men desire, right? It's why they desire it because it's there. And again, how, how does this make sense? Because it's where we came from, right? Our desire for goodness, our desire for true happiness comes from our nature. It's, it's in us like the desire to return to the earth that's in the paperclip, right? Because goodness is where we came from and it's where we want to go back to. So it's both the sum and the cause of our desire. Um, any thoughts on pivot? Stephen says it's what everything revolves around. Okay, so pivot in the sense of being like the center of a of a circle or a sphere, right? Okay, right. Yeah, Jennifer was suggesting a similar thing. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you see it as the central point around which everything orbits, right? That uh, that makes sense. Um, I was thinking of. I guess I was imagining pivot as more like a more like a hinge uh, than a uh, than a center point. But center point certainly makes more sense. Uh, maybe it was merely my visualization that was uh, that was that was in error there. Yeah, yeah, Mick, thinking of it more like axis rather than hinge uh, does does make sense there. Um, okay, good. Anyway, sorry. I'll keep going. The most important object of desire is that for the sake of which something else is sought as a means. As for example, if a person wishes to ride horseback in order to improve his health, he desires the effect of health more than the exercise of riding, right? Again, in other words, uh, why you might be seeking money, right? Again, but it's not the money you seek, right? You're seeking security, but that's not what you really seek, right? You really are seeking true happiness and you're looking for security in money because again, it's, it's, uh, it's an appearance of the good. And so it's leading you on uh, towards it. But ultimately, uh, it's about... Um, um, uh, it, it, it's it's um, uh, it's a it's about um, uh, the their ultimate nature and their na the natural inclinations, um, yeah. Um, all right, good. Let's see. Okay, keep going. Since therefore all things are sought on account of the good, it is the good itself, not the other things, which is desired by everyone. But as we agreed earlier, all those other things are sought for the sake of happiness. Therefore, happiness alone is the object of man's desires. It follows clearly from this that the good and happiness are one and the same thing. And we've already shown that they are God, right? So again, we're kind of we're 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 seeing the thing. But again, she's she's not going to leave any stone unturned here, right? She's going very cautiously, step by step. Um, yeah. Ha <laughs> ha, Stephen, that's good. Uh, Stephen is, uh, says, in response to this, um, the most important object of desire is that for the sake of which something else is sought as a means. And Stephen Cover says, but I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Awesome, Stephen. That's exactly it, right? Uh, Faramir, of course, in the, his conversation to Frodo there about Gondor, uh, is talking about how the warrior culture, right, which we so often see, and as he points out, like which you can see in Rohan, for instance, um, warrior cultures like that are mistaking the means for the end, right? The point of the, 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 the sharpness of the sword and the swiftness of the arrow and the glory of the warrior is not an end in itself, but only a means towards an end uh, and to be focusing on the higher thing. Uh, gold star, Stephen. That's an excellent, excellent connection. Okay. Here's the poem she gives at the end of this section where she's talked about identification of true happiness, the good, and God and that in seeking those things, we seek God, not in the sense of we seek acquaintance with God uh, or just some kind of, you know, sort of second-party relationship with God. We seek to be God, to participate in God, to return to God like a water drop desires to return to the sea. Um, and, uh, and then we get another metaphor in the poem that she gives at the end of this section. Come, all you who are trapped and bound by the foul chains of that deceiving lust 
which occupies earthbound souls. Here you will find rest from your labors, a haven of steady quiet, a refuge from misery. Nothing that the river Tagus with its golden shores can give, nor the Hermus with its jeweled banks, the Indus of the torrid zone, gleaming with green and white stones, none of these can clear man's vision. Instead, they hide blind souls in their shadows. Whatever pleases and excites your mind here, earth has prepared in her deep caves. The shining light which rules and animates the heavens avoids the dark ruins of the soul. Whoever can see this light will discount even the bright rays of Phoebus. Okay, so notice that we get this um, terrestrial metaphor here, right? Um, Come all you who are trapped and bound by the foul chains of that deceiving lust which occupies earth-bound souls. Now, I'd be interested to see, uh, Tom, what Boethius is doing with the Latin in this poem, right? Because uh, it uh, Green in his translation is clearly playing on this idea of binding, right? We've got the uh, the the deceiving lust, uh, the that desire, lust meaning desire, right? That desire for worldly things. To, that deceiving lust, of course, doesn't just refer to sexual lust. It means any of the desire for wealth, the desire for power, any of those desire for the worldly things, which are only distractions, which are those 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 imperfect shadows of a shadow of the good, right? Um, which lead us down these wrong paths. So if you're if you're locked into the desire for those things, you're you're bound by the chains. Of, 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 of lust, of desire, right? You are earthbound um, when you desire to return home, right? When you desire to return uh, to heaven. Where will you find rest from your labors? All of those who are trapped and bound, where will they find rest? Um, whatever pleases and excites your mind here, earth has prepared in her deep caves. The shining light which rules and animates the heavens avoids the dark ruins of the soul. Whoever can see this light will discount even the bright rays of Phoebus. Right. So here, uh, you know, on, down here on Earth, right, and even like within the Earth, there's that uh, there's that sense of uh, of of imprisonment, right? Uh, the 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 these these rivers which bring in wealth, right, hide blind souls in their shadows. Right, uh, so the 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 light can't come in. We're distracted by the things that Earth has prepared in her deep caves. We're locked away from the sun. Right, there might be shiny things down there. Right, the caves uh, the caves might glitter. Right, uh, but they don't shine like the sun. And in the end, they're just keeping us away from the sun. But if we find that shining light which rules and animates the heavens, then we can escape the dark ruins of the soul. And even the light of the sun will be discounted compared to uh, compared to those bright lights. Um, and yes, Julie, I too can't help but think, come unto me, all you who lay, who, 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 who uh, uh, are weary and heavy laden. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yep. Um, good. More on those natural inclinations in prose 11. Even things believed to be inanimate do what is proper to their natures in much the same way. Right? So where she goes on and explains some of the stuff we've been talking about. Why does lightness cause flames to rise and weight cause earth to settle? If not, that these phenomena are appropriate to the things concerned. It's part of their nature. It's part of their essence. It's what they are. In addition, each thing is kept in by being that is kept in being by that which is naturally proper to it, just as each thing is corrupted by that which is naturally opposed to it. Okay. So, principle number one, the thing is what it is, right? And what it is causes it to act, right? Causes its nature, it, it does what is proper to its nature, right? And each thing is kept in being by that which is pr naturally proper to it, and each thing is corrupted by that which is naturally opposed to it. Okay, so he's going to explain. Hard things, such as stones, resist fragmentation by the tough cohesion of their parts, right? So how does 
a stone, how does stone resist fragmentation? By holding together, right? Cohesion, right? Stones, stones stick together. You can tell that stones stick together. Have you ever tried to split up a stone? It's hard work, right? Stones don't easily uh, uh, separate. You've got to, you've got to, you've, you've got to do a heck of a lot to rip them apart. So the like sticks with like, and that's how it retains its solidity, right? But fluid things, such as air and water, are easily parted and then quickly flow together again. Fire, however, cannot be cut at all. We are not concerned here with the voluntary motions of the intelligent soul, but only those natural operations of which we are unconscious, such as, for example, digestion of food and breathing during sleep. Indeed, even in living beings, the desire to live comes not from the wishes of the will, but from the principles of nature. For often the will is driven by powerful causes to seek death, though nature draws back from it. On the other hand, the work of generation, by which alone the continuation of mortal things is achieved, is sometimes restrained by the will, even though nature always desires it. Thus, this love for the self clearly comes from natural instinct and not from voluntary activity. Providence gave to his creatures this great urge for survival so that they would desire to live as long as they naturally could. Therefore, you cannot possibly doubt that everything which exists naturally desires to continue in existence and to avoid harm. What is she talking about? The thing that I want to really emphasize here, because I think that it's important not to get confused about what is being discussed and what's not being discussed in this section, really in this whole part of Book 3. Lady Philosophy is not talking about the will yet, and that's what she's making clear here. She is talking about the natural inclinations of human souls. Not what you choose, but what you are. Right? So, what you choose to do, that's a different question. We're going to come to that. Right? Um, that's going to be what book four is chiefly about. But right now, she's emphasizing what the human soul is like and what it does naturally. Right? And what it does is seek after the good. That's not a choice. Right? It's not something that you do with your will. It is natural. It is as natural as rocks falling. Right? Um, it is, and, and again, so she emphasizes that. Um, we're not concerned here with the voluntary motions of the intelligent soul, but only those natural operations of which we are unconscious. And one of those things, really the primary of those things, is the seeking for happiness. That seeking for, for life. Right? Which and, and you know, so the, the, the desire to procreate, the desire to stay alive, these things are themselves reflections of that central core idea, right? Um, that every human soul desires happiness. It desires the good. It wants to get home to where it belongs, and that is God. Notice this is the answer to her third question. Right? By the end of book three, we can see the answer to all of the questions. Right? Remember the three questions Boethius didn't know the answer to? What led her to diagnose him at the end of book one? Right? He knew that God uh, um, ordered the world, but he couldn't remember how the world was ordered. Answer, by love. Right? As we got in that poem at the end of book two. Um, it is through reason and God's reason that the world is ordered. Uh, two, um, what is the ultimate end of things? We get to that in this section too, right? The good, ultimate happiness, God, is the end and purpose of all things. And three, what is the definition of a man? This is, in a sense, the most important one that is most important, most pivotal to the application to Boethius' situation, right? He says, man is a rational animal. And she says, is that it? Anything else, right? Uh, in a sense, it's like, well, what does that mean? If he's a rational animal, what does it mean to be a rational animal, right? The fact that the human soul comes from God and wants to return from God, that's the key important thing here, right? That's about that definition of humanity that she was trying to get to back in book one. Um, uh, yeah, good. Um, let's keep going. I want to make sure we get through book three tonight. So here's uh, one of those other 
questions answered that I was just talking about. I am greatly pleased with you, my pupil, for you have found the key to truth, and you also see clearly what a while ago you said you did not understand. What is that? I asked. The end or goal of all things. For surely it is, for surely it is that which is desired by all. And since we have identified that as the good, we must conclude that the good is the end toward which all things tend. Right? All things have their source in God. So too all things have their end in God. It is the end and purpose of all things. The good, which is God. Right? And therefore to obtain happiness, to obtain the good, which everything desires. Right? Which everything, uh, 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 whichever, which, we, which is desired by all, as she says here, is divinity, right? That participation in divinity. So, okay, that's the answer to one of those questions. In the, this is the poem now. The man who searches deeply for the truth and wishes to avoid being deceived by false leads must turn the light of his inner vision upon himself. He must guide his soaring thoughts back again and teach his spirit that it possesses, hidden among its own treasures, whatever it seeks outside itself. Let's do that again. The man who seeks, searches deeply for truth and wishes to avoid being deceived by false leads. Right? So if you really want to find true happiness and not just get distracted like the drunken guy, right? Not just get distracted by worldly goods, he must turn the light of his inner vision upon himself. Huh. He must guide his soaring thoughts back again and teach his spirit that it possesses hidden among its own treasures whatever it seeks outside itself. You, f you, you seek for happiness, right? Meaning you don't have it, right? So where do you find it? In yourself, right? Why? Because your soul came from God, right? You got to follow that back, right? Teach your spirit that it possesses hidden among its own treasures whatever it seeks outside itself. Um, so again, we've got to think about what is the nature of the human soul. The human soul came from God and has and is in the image of God. Uh, we got to get back to that. So, okay, so come to a paradoxical conclusion here. Since God is rightly believed to govern all things with the rudder of goodness, and since all these things naturally move toward the good, as I said earlier, can you doubt that they willingly accept his rule and submit freely to his pleasure as subjects who are agreeable and obedient to their leader? This must be so, I answered, for no rule could be called happy if it were a bondage of willing slaves rather than one designed for, their, for the welfare of compliant citizens. Okay, since God governs things with goodness, right, and since all things naturally move toward the good, can you doubt that those things willingly accept his rule and submit freely? Right? That's the chief question. So, okay, um, does God enslave the universe? No. No, again, you don't have to enslave the paperclip to make it fall. Right? It's what it wants to do by its nature. It freely submits to his pleasure as subjects who are agreeable and obedient to, it, to, it, to its leader. Right? So he's like, yeah, well, that has to be. Right? No rule could be called happy if it were a bondage of, of slaves. Uh, okay. All right. Then there is nothing which, by following nature, strives to oppose God? Nothing. And if anything should try to oppose him, could it be at all successful against the one we have rightly shown to be the supreme power of happiness? It would have no chance whatever, I said. Then there is nothing which has either the desire or the power to oppose the highest good? Nothing. Then it is the supreme good which rules all things firmly and disposes all sweetly. This sounds great, right? I mean, oh, like this makes perfect sense, right? Since God directs all things with goodness and everything naturally wants to be good, everything's good, right? That's great. Isn't this good news? Aren't you glad to learn this? Aren't you glad to learn that nothing by its nature strives to oppose God? Right? I mean, why would it? Right? And if anything should try to oppose God, like theoretically, it couldn't do it. It couldn't succeed. Clearly. Right? Because God has the supreme power of happiness. So obviously anything that tried to oppose God would fail to oppose God. 
So nothing has either the desire or power to oppose the highest good. Nah, clearly, nothing would do that, right? So, the supreme good rules all things firmly and disposes all sweetly. Great! Any, any problems? Anybody have any objections to this line of reasoning? Right? Um, uh, yeah, exactly. This doesn't sound much like book one, right? What about where we started? What about why do bad things happen to good people? Um, what about injustice in the world, right? And all the people who do bad things to good people and seem to get away with it, right? Now, Lady Philosophy is like, none of that exists. Don't forget, she's not talking about the human will yet. She's still talking about things in their natures, right? She's talking about the nature of things. It is the nature of the human soul to uh, not to strive to oppose God. Um, it is... Uh, uh, there's nothing which has either... De- so, so nothing in, which in its nature has the desire, the power to oppose the highest good. And again, this is proved by the fact that everybody seeks happiness. The very things that people are doing, right? The the pleasure that people take or the wealth that they seek to accumulate. I mean, th- let's think about the people who screwed over Boethius, right? That he was complaining about back in book one. Why did they do that? Right? Why did the, I, even again, even granting that everything is exactly as he said, right? Um, and these bad people who were already criminals, you know, lied and framed him in order to, uh, uh, to falsely accuse him uh, and tear him down from his position. Why do they do this? Right? Out of envy? Right? To satisfy their own jealous desires? Did they do it out of um, uh, greed? Right? Because he was wealthy and his uh, estates probably got seized by somebody and awarded to somebody. So, you know, somebody could have been after his stuff. Right? Um, he was in a position of power and respect, and they might have wanted his the power and respect that he had for themselves, or at least to undermine him for their own reasons, right? So they were seeking all those things, right? So we think about what is the reason by you know for which these guys all did these horrible things, right? There was some earthly good, right? There was some one of the goods of fortune that they were seeking for. Um. In a, why were they doing that? Because they were seeking happiness, right? That's why you do it. Um, and the fact that they were seeking happiness, the fact that they were going after those worldly goods shows that their natures, in their natures, were not opposing God. Were seeking after the good, seeking after happiness. Now, they were taking a bad road to it, right? They were like particularly drunken guys, right? Staggering down a very wrong road. But still, they're trying to find their way home, right? So in that sense, everything follows God in its nature, right? Not in the will. Um, we're going we're, we're gonna to come to that. But it is, I think it's meant to be uh, an almost... Um, an almost, well, I mean, I said paradoxical. Um, I, I think this is meant to be an almost comically, kind of unlikely conclusion, right? I mean, she comes to this point and she's like, so supreme good rules all things firmly and disposes all sweetly, right? So, you know, gosh, you were all upset before, but now you see that everything is awesome, in fact, right? Everything actually is awesome and there's nothing wrong with anything and everything's perfectly fine. Right, um, sort of yes and no, but it's it's. I think this this conclusion is stated in this kind of deliberately paradoxical way, right? Um, <laughs> Stephen, nice Stephen, cover with the awesome apposite Tolkien quotations this evening. For nothing is evil in the beginning; even Sauron was not so. Yes, nothing is evil in its nature, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so she draws a conclusion from this, right? No one can doubt that God is almighty, philosophy began. 
Certainly not, unless he's mad, I answered. But nothing is impossible for one who is almighty. Nothing. Then can God do evil? No, of course not. Then evil is nothing, since God, who can do all things, cannot do evil. Now it sounds like, okay, now we're just being clever, right? Surely this is just sophistry. Okay, so now we're just saying evil is nothing because God can't do it. I mean, this this just, like, philosophy, seriously. Are we just doing word games now, right? Is your answer to the problem of evil just going to be that there isn't any evil and it's all in your mind? I mean, that seems rather unsatisfactory, right? And I love Boethius' response, right? Notice Boethius doesn't hide from this. The Boethius character's response is, you're playing with me, <laughs> right? He acknowledges this. Hang on. Uh, well, hang on. I mean, time out here, Lady Philosophy, right? Ouch. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Note to self. Don't make time out gesture with broken fingers. Um, yeah, so... Uh, um, yeah. You're playing with me, Lady Philosophy, right? I mean, there's the, the evil is nothing, right? Um, look at her. Uh, look at her response. Her response is the poem, the poem of Orpheus and Eurydice, which, by the way, in the Middle Ages was the most famous of all of the poems in the Consolation of Philosophy. At last, the Judge of Souls, moved by pity, is the end of the poem. Moved by pity, declares, we are conquered. We return to this man his wife, his companion, purchased by his song. But our gift is bound by the condition that he must not look back until he has left hell. But who can give lovers a law? Love is a stronger law unto itself. As they approached the edge of the night, at the edge of night, Orpheus looked back at Eurydice, lost her, and died. This fable applies to all of you who seek to raise your minds to sovereign day. For whoever is conquered and turns his eyes to the pit of hell, looking into the inferno, loses all the excellence he has gained. The application of Orpheus and Eurydice here is unexpected in some ways. Right? The story of Orpheus and Eurydice, Orpheus, the great the greatest of all musicians, right, who loses his wife and who descends into the underworld to retrieve her and to bring her back up. Remember that, like, the deep caves of Earth and the light of the uh, world above? She was using it in an earlier poem as a metaphor, right, of being the in sort of enslavement to worldly things and earthly desires compared to or contrasted with uh, the the light of the outside world, right? Recalling, as, as, as uh, uh, one of you was saying, um, uh, Plato's uh, analogy of the cave, right? Um, yeah, okay. Um, now, it's kind of turned around, in a sense, right? Um, it's we who are like Orpheus. The whole application of the... You know, so it might sound, at first... I mean, the first way I would have been tempted to allegorize or the Orpheus and Eurydice story at first would have been, uh, you know, that uh, so like we would be like Eurydice, right? Being led out of captivity and back towards the light. But we're not Eurydice. We're Orpheus here, right? Um, and it's all about the turning back and the turning and looking back down towards the underworld, right? Back at the desired object, um, which is the desired object which is behind him. In other words, notice in the way that uh, Lady Philosophy is applying this myth, Eurydice is not Orpheus's ultimate happiness, right? Or Eurydice is like a distraction, right? Um, or rather, his union with Eurydice does not happen because he looks back towards the underworld instead of keeping his eyes raised to sovereign day. He turned his eyes to the pit of hell, looking into the inferno, loses all the excellence that he gained. Right? This is her warning in the poem, right? So, okay. Uh, were you troubled by the end of book three? Right? Were you troubled by these sort of 
casual assertions that actually everything's great, everything totally obeys God, and there's no disorder in the world, and by the way, evil is nothing by definition, right? So, the end, right? Thank you for asking. I'm glad, I'm so glad we, uh, I'm so glad we solved, uh, we solved these issues here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, um, if we were attempted to respond like Boethius and say, you're playing with me, Lady Philosophy, right? You're just, you're just, you're, you know, Lady Philosophy, you're, you're, you're dodging the issue just like I was dodging Kevin's question earlier tonight. Um, and she's like, she, and her response to that is, don't do an Orpheus now, right? Don't look back. Don't look back. Keep your eyes fixed on where we're, when we did the invocation, Right, we've been focused on God as the good, as the 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 this 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 highest principle, right? This ultimate happiness that everyone seeks reunion with, right? So don't turn away from it, don't get distracted. But she's going to come back to the will. She's going to come back and show how these things make sense, how these statements, evil is nothing, and. Uh, Everything obeys God, right? She's going to show how these make sense in the context of the world we actually live in, right? Um, this is why uh, book four is my favorite. Book five is awesome. I mean, that's where, you know, we really get to the heights, but uh, book four is my favorite uh, and the one that I myself keep coming back to. Um, on the, uh, the subject of kind of keeping it real, I mean, I was reading through this and working on this, actually, uh, I was kind of s- struck by this. Um, I spent a bunch of the day yesterday in a surgical waiting room uh, in a hospital while uh, a family member was having surgery, um, and I was prepping my Boethius class in a surgical waiting room, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> hashtag keeping it real here today. Um uh, yeah, yeah. So here I'm. You know, I, I I have to admit I did have some sympathy with Boethius's. You're playing with me, weighty philosophy, right? Um, where she gets by the end of book three doesn't seem real, right? It doesn't seem relevant uh, to the actual world, right? Like now we've built this big, you know, edifice of step by step logic, and it seems to have led us somewhere which uh, doesn't apply to the world uh, that we actually see around us. Um, well, we'll come back to it again. We're, she's going to, she's going to, she's going to make it real again, bring it back, uh, to application in book four. Um, all right, good, good. Um, we're going to leave it there because this is the end. It's the end of book three. We got to the end of book three. Um, Yeah, I I've been getting some questions from you guys and I want to I want to go over those. I may and don't tell anybody, but I may end up adding a a, a week uh, an extra session to the class so that we can get a a a, a, a week full of uh, people's questions. Uh, I'd really like to do that. Um we'll see. We'll see how things go. Um Yeah, yeah. Um all right, more on the nature of evil and uh, uh, and stuff as we get into book four. Please do read, if you can, read all of book four next time. We're not going to get through the whole of book four, uh, but we'll, I'll get through as much as we can, and then we'll uh, then we'll 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 carry on uh, into week five. Thanks everybody uh, for joining me again, and uh, I'm glad to be home. I'll still be here next week. So excited uh, and uh, so good to meet those of you. I see several of you, Evan. I see uh, I see you, Evan. I see your last comment there. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, Evan, it was great meeting you also at uh, at Myth Mood. So many uh, great people. Several of you here tonight that I got to hang out th- out with out with this past weekend. Um, All right. Thanks, everybody. And I will see you guys next week. Good night now.